Good evening and welcome. Uh, we're here for the treestuff.com live webinar on SRT. Kevin Bingham, I'm Nick Bonner. Uh, thank you guys all for joining us. There's quite a few people here so far. Um, I want to thank the whole staff here at TreeStuff for helping us make this possible. Everyone kind of pitched in throughout the day in their own way to get all this set up and do this. A big thank you to Kale Royer on our camera and Carson Royer on the control panel. Uh, without those guys, we wouldn't be able to do this. So. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. Um, Kevin, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I heard that you, you had some trouble today. Your, your mini loader broke? Yeah. It's yeah. out in the street or? It's in the backyard. The, your it's backyard? In, no, no, not in my backyard. In a very nice backyard in Bloomfield Hills. Okay. Um, not the best situation. Well, we're all pulling for you. If you guys have ideas on how Kevin can get the, his mini loader with a broken hydraulic pump out of a very nice backyard, put them in the Facebook uh, and we'll read them to them at the end of the night. We're going <laughs> to see who gets the best idea. Um, but yeah, thanks. I know that's a hassle. So we all kind of identify with that. So thanks for making yep. it under those, those conditions. Oh, I had to get out of there. I just had to leave. <laughs> so. so we'll jump right in here. Um, you invented SRT. No, no, not at all. Well, okay. So tell, tell me about that. I, I'm under the impression you invented it. Tell, no, tell SRT, SRT has been around for as long as people have been climbing ropes. Um, I began climbing SRT as a rock climber. Um, it depends on, I guess, what your definition of SRT is. Uh, some people say SRT is single rope technique, in which case everybody who's climbing on a single rope is climbing SRT. Because there's just one. There's just one. Um, so the SRT has basically been named stationary rope technique. And stationary rope technique maybe a better word for it um, for what we're talking about today but that also has been around since as long as people have been climbing ropes um i tell, think tell me how you got start what drove you to start climbing single rope as an arborist well there's a couple things um i like i got into the world of rope work through rock climbing um when i was a kid you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. Um, I didn't get into arbor culture until I graduated from high school. I got a job right out of high school and I learned the taut line hitch and the Blake's hitch. Um, so a lot of guys start out. Yes, and uh, I went with it. It was fine. It didn't ever seem to me to be quite efficient. Uh, there were some advances made while I was uh, working on a double line such as the hitch climber pulley and um, can be the use of cambium savers the a split tail system were uh, big things that made it easier um, i think for my personal climbing style i always uh, sort of gravitated to a more uh, one to one climbing ratio um, foot locking i can you know we can go over foot locking real quick uh, so and for those of you who don't know, foot locking is our basic method of entry. This is how guys got up the tree before they learned some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. And my father actually climbed, he learned how to climb from Davy climbers who took care of his oak trees in North Carolina. They were foot locking back in the 50s. Um, they did not use a, um, a backup rope or anything, but my dad learned how to foot lock when he was um, young. He actually taught me how to foot lock before I even knew what tree work was. Um, but foot locking, as we know it, is climbing on a stationary line. And so this is probably my first use of stationary rope technique in arbor culture is, is the foot lock. And you basically, this is my backup knot. Um, in a foot lock, I am actually, I climb the rope and I secure myself with my body. In the old days, they would spend, they didn't have a backup knot, so they would climb just until they got up to the top of the tree, and then they would tie in. But this press That's it crazy, hitch- crazy, by the way. You shouldn't do that. This press it hitch is there to save you and hold you. Progress capture, shall we say. Um, it's very safe. The one thing you don't want to do is put your hand above your hitch 
the natural panic position of a human when they're falling is to reach up as high as they can and to grip as hard, hard as they can. So this would, if you did that, you could pull down your hitch cord, and, which could lead to an uncontrolled fall. So you make, you make this look pretty easy. And I, I'll tell you, we all know, anybody who's tried it, foot locking isn't easy. Um, we're not all as tall and fit and you know, athletic as Kevin. And doing that was really a hard thing for a lot of climbers. I know when I started climbing, foot locking was difficult. And, um, it does take some practice, um, but I would say that foot locking and the way I approached it, you know, some people, you can, you can foot lock down the rope as well as up the rope. Um, I did this as a climber, I'm pro probably not supposed to, but that was my first use of stationary rope technique in, in, in actual arbor culture. And when you got up there, you were still climbing and tying in with a double rope system. You still had to isolate your line. And these are things we'll talk about later. But Yeah, so um, with obviously, you do have to isolate your line. Um, and that, that is the other reason why I started gravitating more toward a single or a stationary rope system. Um, isolating the line is very difficult, although I did before, there's no reason that you need to footlock on a double rope. You can... You can footlock a single line. You can footlock a single line, and if you can't, on certain trees, if you can't necessarily get your rope isolated, there's no reason why you can't set it up on a single line. And you could use a hand ascender or... You can use a hand things. ascender. Um, you can... There's, there's multiple ways to do it, but it's... Really, um, the way I've been thinking about it and explaining it to people is you have a moving rope system and a stationary rope system, which basically is, think about it like gears on a bicycle. You have a two to one ratio in your moving system. Um, Versus a one to one ratio in an SRT system. A one to one system, so it's basically same rope, same everything, you're just changing gears. And sometimes you might want to see with, a, with this two to one system, I can pull myself up and I'm pulling half my weight. Um, so tell me a little bit, I know, I know the story, but the, the people here don't. You're in Texas, right? And you were climbing DRT and you were like, I had enough. Well, so, yeah, I was, um, I went down to do hurricane work in 2008 in Houston, outside of Houston, and um, they call this area of Texas the Big Thicket, and it's trees maybe 40 to 50 feet tall, uh, really dense, lots of thorns, branches everywhere, really gnarly, gnarly stuff. Um, Hard to get a line set, hard to get into. Really hard to get a line set. And so I was sitting there and I was getting paid by the tree, so it was really difficult for me to, to justify any time spent, you know, double bagging my line, um, trying to wiggle this thing through. You know, when I first got down there, I was going with you know, trying to set a cambium saver that quickly went out the window just because I was under such pressure to make money and get up the next tree as fast as I could. So I basically started just, um, you know, throwing my line over, pulling up, up, pulling up my rope wherever it fell. And um, I uh, went to Walgreens or Walmart and um, got a ladder. Um, which I, it's funny because when I started on a ladder at Walgreens or Walmart, you know, uh, uh, this is Texas. Um, and then I would just tie a running bowl in at the base of the tree and, um, my ground guy would set up the, the ladder on the tree. I would grab my, hitch and 
Just tie in the same way you would for a double rope. Just same as I would for double rope. But you ran into problems here because you can't come down that way. You can't cut. Right, that's the secret to this is that the Prusik won't function with just a single user's weight on it on a single leg. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, it does function. And I climbed just like this for at, at least a couple of weeks. Um, but how did you descend? With just brute force. And there's nothing, I, and I think this is a misconception that people have is that um, there's nothing inherently dangerous about a prussic cord on a single line. Um, people, people will say, oh, it'll burn up, it'll crash you to the ground if you try to descend. And I think some of that comes from the notion, the, the, the fact of what I was just pointing out with the footlock cord, right? Um, that if, if that cord is set way above you high and you put your hand above it, you can cause some problems. But a well-tied hitch that's solid. It's going to hold you. It's going to hold you. It's, it's tricky, but you know, I can climb, I climb my ladder get to where I'm going, this hitch is solid. It locks down. I can work it. It's not the easiest thing to do, but I would by no means call it dangerous. I mean, people might object to this, but I, in my experience, never experienced anything other than it being really difficult. And it heats up your hands. I actually, at that point, even had 10x climbing uh, which hitches, is not heat which is not heat resistant at all. And they would get glazed, burn up. My hands and my gloves would get really hot. Okay, I'm, so tell me what we, we doesn't work. How did we fix it? What was the next step? Well, so I climbed on that for, for a while. Um, probably, yeah, almost two weeks of my, I was there for about a month. And I went, to SRT probably within the first three or four days because of the base anchor setting a line, the nature of the trees. In those trees, I didn't actually have to be dangling in the thin air all that much. So, you know, working a hitch like on the ground isn't that bad of a problem. And I went through a few hitch cords just because they would get so crispy. Um, but you know, you keep an eye on them and uh, just like anything else. Uh, I did have a figure eight with me. Um, I experimented a couple with a couple of things and I had done spar work using a eight above my um, hitch before. Um, and this is a great technique for working on a spar because you can just uh, and I think Mark Chisholm showed me to do this. Because uh, on a spar, you're basically coming down. And so I experimented with this a little bit. And this is great. It takes the, takes the heat off of your hitch and allows it to work. But as soon as you want to go back up the rope, it stalls kind of totally. It, it doesn't work. It, it really is limiting. Um, so that's one I think you've got it. Oh, yes. I, I had a revolver here um, that I had purchased with no real... Where did you, where did you get it? Um, if it wasn't Tree Stuff, don't say. Yeah, it was not Tree Stuff. Oh, man. I don't think Tree Stuff... Not Walmart. Not Walgreens. It could have been. When did Tree Stuff... When did Tree Stuff happen? 11, 11 years? 10 years? 10 years. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So it was just brand new. This was in 2008. So I don't know. If, so you, we'll, we'll forgive you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I didn't buy it at, I mean, I did buy it at Cheryl probably. Does that count? Oof. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm positive. <laughs> All right. I don't know even know if I got it at Cheryl. Well, I wonder. Anyway, I ended up, I had no use for this revolver until I kind of snapped these two together in this way. And this opened up things considerably for me um, because the, this will actually, you can tend it. And when you descend, it takes the hitch, friction off of your hitch. 
And you know, as a, if I can climb, I can. My tether's a little bit weird, but still looks a little cumbersome. But definitely, from going where we were just holding the uh, just holding the prusik, it seems like it worked. Yeah, this is a this was a huge. I mean, this was the end of my regular climbing for in the moving rope technique. After I came across this method, I have rarely climbed double rope since. And then this um, eventually evolved into using like a box wrench, which yes. then became the wooden rope wrenches. Yep. And then eventually we made it all the way to the, Z the ZK1. The ZK1 um, and then the ZK2. A, a bunch of different trial and error of getting, as you can see with this technique, it works great if you're on the tree, but for me to go directly up the tree, I have to pop this off and then I can set my um, lanyard over the shoulder. And so there's a misconception about um, SRT is that, oh, it's super gear intensive. If you notice here, I'm actually less gear than I, was in double rope. I'm actually one, uh, so I can foot lock up the rope. I think it's fair to say though that Kevin, that most people cannot foot lock. Foot lock a well, this is line. a that's silly. Most but everybody should be able to foot lock on a single line. And if you'll notice, I'm in this method. I'm Pretty doing hard. a sit stand foot foot lock here. So I have all the time in the world. If you want to take a foot lock with an extra. You know, when I'm teaching young, younger people how to footlock, you can take an extra grab if you have difficulty, but it's still all leg work. I'm not, you know, I'm not forcing my arms at all. Then I get to where I want to go, take my lanyard off the shoulder, and then I have to reinstall this before I can come down. So there's definitely some cumbersome issues with the Fate Revolver. But for the most part, it liberates you from the problems of double rope climbing. Very yeah. cool. Well, it's always, it's always a pleasure to see the Fate Revolver and you know, to really see what you started with. And um, I'm excited to show people what we have made it to eventually. Uh, I'm excited we have ISA CEUs for this presentation. Uh, they do make us give them a test. So we've got a presentation. Uh, okay. I want to jump into it. All right. And um, we can come back and hit any of these topics, but let's, uh, let's get into it here. So uh, our first slide is, you know, unfortunately a disclaimer. Um, this is not real training, folks. This is here to teach you and educate you, but this is not a substitute for professional training. Uh, if you've never done this before, I recommend getting with a professional uh, and practicing very low and, and very slow. So, um, first we'll talk about some of the benefits of SRT here. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but a one-to-one -one input. Um, yeah, so, um, I wanna, one of the things I wanna point out with SRT and moving like, a lot of people get caught up into what tool or what device. Um, it really, the, the main thing is, are you in a moving rope system or, a, you know, there's variations of efficiency and variations of technique, but for the most part, there's a moving system and a stationary system. And this is a double rope system. And just briefly, if I'm working in a double rope system, I have a two to one ratio so I can pull myself up from limb walks. And this is another problem when I had when I was um, climbing in a double rope system. A lot of people are very good at pulling themselves up this way and tending their rope. And, I've, and this is sort of a, just a personal thing. I always ended up grabbing both sides and pulling myself up in a one to one system anyway. And then I end up with this huge thing of slack and I have to figure out which hand to let go of in order to, to, to tend my slack. So not, that works well for some people. It never really worked well for me. 
Um, coming back from limb walks, I always still would come back in a one-to-one -one climbing style. So we have the benefit of having the mechanical advantage. You have that benefit. It takes half the effort to pull yourself in, but you have to pull yourself twice as far. You have to pull, yeah. For every foot of rope I travel, I have to manage two feet of rope. And that also means that I have, if I'm up at the top of the tree with a 200 foot rope, that means I have 200 feet of rope below me, basically. If I'm up at the top by my anchor point, and that's all that rope I have to manage. And that, so, that plays well into, into friction. So um, come around here for me. Let's take a look here, I'll cross over you. But as you come here, you're fighting all this friction and coming around. And if you come, come back around, let's see if we can, uh, See if you can redirect your line up into that union up there, what that looks like. Yeah, so, again, basically. Nothing, it's, it's pretty impossible to move. I, I can move, but it's definitely, especially coming back, I definitely don't have my two to one help anymore. <laughs> so let's look at, let's compare that to a si single rope system. So, rock exotica. So you're going to see here the consistent friction from SRT is, is a big difference. Look, show us the same, the, kind of the same maneuver there. So I can come over here, redirect over here. Obviously my friction stays the same. What I have to do in my system stays the same. I can come over here. I actually, I actually can throw a knot on it, whatever. My friction still stays the same. So I, that's a huge benefit when you're working around the trees. And when I was in Texas, the trees were close together. Um, and I was getting paid by the tree. So in Texas, I could literally just go horizontally from tree to tree to tree to tree with my... Because they were short and you had a lot of rope. I had a lot of rope, they were short, they were close together, and I was passing through this, this big thicket and not having to worry about my friction. Whereas if I was in a double rope system, I would have to be consistently re-tying my tying point. And not every time, I mean, for instance, with the redirect, here's my top anchor. But sometimes I want to anchor a redirect on this, you know, and that's not something I would want as my primary anchor point. But now it is, for all intents and purposes, your, your primary suspension point. Yeah, this is where, this is what I'm operating from now, but the weight is still largely up there. You can do a calculation as to what this is seeing, but with a large angle like that, it's really not yeah. seeing it, that considerably. When you think about a large tree, you have to, come down one side and work it in double rope, go back up to the center, come back down the other side, go back up to the center, come down a third and maybe even a fourth size side of the tree if it's big enough. With SRT, you can kind of zigzag and go laterally in the tree in a way that's really a lot more difficult without changing your anchor point in a double rope system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's when you get to the point of rope or tree planning and it's a very different mindset if you're thinking about in a doubled rope system, a moving rope system, you want to have that high central tying point and you want to keep your path clear so you, have, you don't get caught up in too much friction. Um, you don't have as much liberty to use, a, use redirects, multiple redirects. Um, there's things you can do in a double rope system that, you, that are more complicated. Um, one of the nice things about a double rope system is that you can, you always have access to retrieve your line. That's true. Um, sometimes in a single rope system, you know, if I'm, if I'm a base anchor is over there, I can't do anything about it. Um, I can't move it. Um, but you can so. reposition it, and that's something that we're going to talk about and demonstrate a little later. You know, I think, when I think about DRT, I always think about how the mechanical advantage makes it easier for me. But one of the things that uh, SRT users always talk about is how it's easier on their body. Explain that to me. You know, it, is it because I'm always using my legs? You know, why is it easier when I actually have to pull more weight? It, 
talk well, about that a little bit? So, easier? I mean, I think this is, it's, it varies from person to person. I think there are people where double rope climbing is suited better for, um, absolutely. And I think there are people that single or stationary rope climbing is suited better for. Um, there are moves in stationary rope technique that require a lot of power um, when you, that you might want. Sometimes coming back from a limb walk, for example, you don't have that two to one. Um, a lot of people going into a stationary climbing system, when they first get into it, in, a, in, in double rope, here. In double rope climbing, since you're using that two to one, you are relying on your, your upper body a little bit more. You're only carrying half of the weight with your upper body. But you're, and you're also using the body thrust, and so your positioning tends to be, a lot of times, you'll be back here, you know. That's not the best hitch right there. Ugh. So you have to be careful about your hitches, even in double rope climbing. A good hitch. You need good, good, good hitches. But as you can see, people in a moving rope system, your position tends to be a little bit leaning back because you're pulling with your arms. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned the limb walk. This is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. So we, we've seen you kind of go out and come back on that and we know that you're strong enough to pull. This is something that a lot of people start with. A lot of people ask questions about. Can you show me what I have set up here and talk a little bit about it real quick? Yeah, so this is a technique. Um, I rarely use this, um, but it is an option. Sometimes actually I, when I do use it, will be on when I'm on spurs on a spar um, and I want to pull myself back up. This is in an essence, you're in a single rope or stationary rope climbing system. And um, I often use an ascender. Um, there's other ways to set this up, but you can move this into a three to one climbing system quite easily by, you come out on your limb walk and for those that like to have that natural pull, this enables you to do that. If you had a pulley up there, it's even better. Um, with the rope runner, you wanna watch. That's a good way to overcome the, the kind of the limitation yeah. of the one to one input. That's, a, know, that's a definitely a way to overcome. It brings up, I, I think, some of the cons of SRT that I want to talk about. And you know, you've touched on these, that it's more gear intensive or that that's a, a thing that's associated with it. I think I'm one of the people that thinks it is a little more gear intensive. I think most people require a foot ascender as you're, you're going to put on here for us. Um, it does require new equipment. Uh, you know, as we start talking about rope wrench and the rope runner and different climbing systems, you know, those do present a, an added expense to people that already own mm -hmm. everything they need to climb double rope. You know, it's, it's hard to argue with the fact that when you do climb DRT, you just need basically your rope. And, you know, you can tie in with a, a closed system. Um, one of the things that I find really difficult about SRT is, is how I advance my anchor. Um, I'm very bad with the throw ball. Uh, so, you know, I get a base tie put in. It's usually pretty low. Um, something I just took what I got and I get up there and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of tree above me. How do I advance this base tie up there? And, um, that's something that, that struggles. Can you demonstrate and show me kind of what you do to help advance your base tie or, or talk um, me through that a little bit? Yeah. So I'm going to just start at the ground. Yep, we can pull this rope right out. That end and, I'll pull this off. and there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, and there's no shame if you're climbing a tree from the ground up. Um, and it's funny because a lot of people will climb a single or a stationary rope to access the tree, and then they'll convert into a moving rope system to work the tree. And I'm somewhat the opposite in that I'll use a moving rope system to get up the tree and then I'll transfer over into a stationary technique to um, so anyway 
you don't necessarily have to do that. You can start, if you're starting with, if you, if you want a base anchor on the ground, say I didn't hit my primary tie in point, but I uh, still have a base anchor. And nice Yosemite bowlin with a little back up there. Um, you can either, still can't figure out these Rocco's. Um, so I'm climbing in the tree. And, you know, let's say for just for example, that you kind of you achieved this tie in. This is where you, you threw to. Right. Um, it's somewhat similar to how you would do it in double rope, but I can take a little bite and just toss it over. And I don't need to pull out, you know, there was a discussion online and somebody was saying that they throw their tail over first and then pull the whole thing up. But until I get to where I'm going, all I need to do is throw my throw a bite over. Um, another thing that you can do is use a, a sling. A sling is nice because you can kind of uh, here. Do you have another press it cord? Give me a press it cord with a beaner. But you can use a sling or a press it cord. And this is almost like a, becomes like lead climbing in, in rock climbing. You can advance up this way, or you can, um, until you get to where you want to go, using your lanyard to secure yourself. Kevin, there's 300 people watching. I see that. It's pretty awesome. I'm up here acting a fool. I'm, um, I'm learning a lot. I'm having fun. So, you know, use of, use of slings is a really good way to get around. Um, you can, once you get to your next spot, you can take that out. You can move it again. If you have, you can use several, um, you know, and then once you, once you get to where you want to go, you pull your rope out. Awesome. That's very cool. Uh, I want to I want to get into kind of some of the stuff that we have hanging over here, Kevin. So uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about the different SRT systems that are available today, and I think it makes sense to start first and foremost um, with uh, with this one right here. Kevin uh, Kevin brought his daughter with him today. How old is, is Shushu? She's three, almost four. She's three, and I I'm talking to her, and I was like, Did you know that I invented this right here? And she's like, No, you didn't. <laughs> so uh, tell us, this is what, it, what are we looking at here? What is it, and how does it work? This is the rope wrench. Um, the inspiration was an actual 13 millimeter box wrench. Um, Which what it will does, tear your rope up. What it does is it takes a kink in the rope. Um, there's a little bit of a lever arm. There's two friction points here, and so it very simple just takes enough heat away from your rope that your hitch can function um, without you having the issues that I did in Texas. Um, the hitch is still the primary, your primary, you, wanna, you want your hitch to work without the wrench being there. Because the wrench will not hold you up without a hitch. The so. wrench alone does nothing, so your hitch is, needs to be everything. Um, and the hitch, 
the rope wrench basically is just a, a tool to allow your hitch to work better. It doesn't make your hitch safer. It doesn't make your hitch do anything other than um, it allows you to descend comfortably. So show me how it works. Um, yeah, basically, I've got my foot ascender on. I can use my lanyard over the shoulder. Uh, can clip it into here. Sometimes if you have your uh, a hitch climber, you can clip it down into there. Foot ascenders are always really nice. So this is the thing with, uh, we're talking about your, your positioning. Uh, for stationary rope climbing, you want your body vertical. You want your, um, you kind of oriented up the rope. Here I'm just using one, one leg. You can add ascenders into that system. There's multiple, multiple ascent systems. But then when you get to where you want to go, the wrench, um, and that's one thing you, before you start descending, you want to make sure that gets a little bit of engaged so you don't have to pull down too hard on your hitch to make it operate. But that's basically what it does. It allows you to comfortably operate a hitch. So this is an improvement. This is the, the next step from the Fate Revolver. Yeah, so the Fate Revolver was great. Um, I took it apart, it's gone. I, uh, you know, I competed in a couple competitions with it. Uh, I won. Um, it was allowed in the 2009. They didn't know what they were looking at, did they? It, it was allowed in the in 2009 ITCC. ITCC. Um, so it was, it's a, a perfectly show. good, good stationary rope technique. But like I said, you have to constantly pop off your Fate revolver, put it back on take it back off, where the wrench, it can stay on your system and you can climb, climb freely. Cool. I mean, if you, you look at, um, this is basically the, your uh, double rope system, the kink is being formed up at the top of the, the tree. So that tree, the tree branch is acting as your, your rope wrench. Um, my first- This takes the same amount of friction that the branch does. Similar, I would say this is more like climbing on a, um, would be more like climbing on a pulley than on a raw branch, a natural branch. But, but it gives you what you need. It gives you what you need for your pitch to, 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 to work. Awesome, well there's, there's a lot of mechanicals on the market. Um, the Unisender is one of the, one of the first ones. Oh man, this is a carabiner challenge here. This has got a ball lock for you, Kevin. Different, all sorts I of love the carabiner button. mechanisms. So I was um, in 2004, um, the TCIA show came to Detroit and I met Morgan Thompson there. Tom Dunlap was there. Um, Tom Dunlap had recently been converted to climbing stationary rope technique using a unisender. Um, and man, I would have saved myself a lot of trouble if I had just gotten one at that uh, time. It was a little bit pricier than I could afford back in, I think it was, yeah, it was 2004. Um, but yeah, this is a great, great tool. Um, very simple, it comes on and off the rope really fast, which is a great attribute for any tool. Um, it's made out of aluminum. I think the biggest complaint that people have is it wears quickly. Uh, but if you're easy on it, it's awesome. And it works well, from what I understand, it was originally designed to be used in a moving rope system. And it was discovered after he developed it that you could take a wrap around it and it would work uh, to descend single, single rope. And that's its more popular use these days as a single rope. Awesome. Well, Tends up the rope, excellent. Um, Really great, great tool. Definitely the first multi-sender that I know of. Absolutely. To really. And the ability to change between DRT and SRT with this tool was really a, a big step forward. And um, you see how easily Kevin can take it off the rope. Uh, Rock Exotica does a great job making stuff. And um, yeah, it's the beautiful. Unisender's a, a really beautiful part. It's very, very nice. And 
Um, people like it a lot. As we talk about mechanicals, we'll get to the rope runner eventually, but there's a lot of buzz. Uh, there's new stuff coming out, the akimbo. Um, I know you've tried it. Do you like it? What can you tell me about it? It's, it's amazing. It's I mean, awesome. It it's comes on and off the rope really fast. It's light, compact. I mean, I can't, I can't say anything negative about the akimbo. Cool. Very cool. Well, uh, I, I'm sure people are going to ask. We don't know when it's coming out. Um, it's totally outside of our control. But uh, we're excited, and uh, we'll definitely be carrying it, and I'm sure everyone will have one. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty cool thing. So uh, we, we touched on the rope runner. We saw you climbing on it a little earlier. This is kind of, for me, you know, the next generation, the, the, like the current evolution of mechanicals. And, um, yeah, I mean, this tons is... Tons of guys on them. The rope runner, uh, I was... When I was working on the rope wrench, some of the feedback that I got, uh, especially I was wanting to participate in the tree climbing competitions, and they wanted to develop, well, they wanted me to develop the rope wrench as a system, as a package, um, similar to like the CE climb where it comes all together in one package. And my, my belief regarding hitches is that they're so unique and so variable. Every hitch is different. Every hitch works different on a different rope. Um, some guys like longer hitches. Some guys like shorter hitches. Uh, that there's no real way to package it. So, but the conversation got me inspired to work on a mechanical because a mechanical is obviously it is what it is. Um, and so. The rope runner came out of that. It's got some aspects of the rope wrench. Um, it's got some aspects of the hitchhiker. It's got, it's got some inspiration from the unisender. It's a, kind of a hodgepodge of devices. You, you all developed mixing. this, you developed this like, like a lot of your tools uh, yourself, cutting the metal yourself, assembling it yourself, uh, doing it at the tech shop, yeah? Yeah, um, the, the tech shop actually came after I had developed the rope runner. My first rope runner I had cut out of um, you, uh, just sheets of aluminum using a Sawzall. And then I was at a customer's house and he saw this raggedy, taggedy looking tool and was like, have you ever heard of tech shop? And um, he told me about tech shop, which is a maker space. It has all the tools you need to CNC, water jet, um, vertical mills, lathes, everything you could possibly. So I went there straight away. I got a membership and have just been hooked ever since. And then I ended up with a Dirty 30 blue rope runner. Yeah, I was able Luke to, tech, tech Shop enabled me to get the concept from this chunk of sharp aluminum <laughs> to an actual something that you know I could, um, process and get other climbers on and um, so that was really cool. It's, it's obviously a process that you enjoy but I know that not everyone around you enjoys it quite as much as you do and um, specifically the guys on your crew you know you'll hear Jeremy will tell me stories he's like you know we were at the job today and Kevin just came out of the tree and got in his car and left and uh, <laughs> what, where do when you leave where, where what, what's going on like why do you just leave the job and yeah leave, I mean like, especially without telling him or um, what, what are you doing? Well, sometimes it's because like my loader will have broken down and I just have to leave. <laughs> but other times, you know, uh, w w with these devices, um, and I'm sure Jamie Merritt and Paul Cox and all these guys that um, Gordon, um, they can attest to the fact that you know a millimeter difference, one direction or another, makes a substantial difference. So. Sometimes during the development of this, I would something you address in the middle of a work day. Yeah, You'll like oh my god, part. this needs to be. I need to move this over a millimeter, or I need to make this angle a little steeper. I mean, let me try this a little bit longer. Try it the same day. Cut it and, and try it. And the tech shop was enabled me to go drive over there, cut something out, and make it back to the tree to finish finish the tree. That's and awesome. so, yeah, this is a really valuable. Um, really valuable tool and if you have one in your city um, definitely would check worth checking out we want to, we want to uh, make sure that we talk a, a little bit tonight about anchors um, we talked about base anchoring you showed us Yosemite Bolin um, 
let's talk about some of the different ways to base anchor and to do canopy ties. And then after that, we want to talk about a little bit about the forces and what that does to the anchor. So, um, you know, you showed us a, a really simple base tie uh, with just a running bowline and a Yosemite backup. Um, I was always a big fan of installing some butterfly knots above a simple tied base tie like that. Uh, by tying a butterfly knot, you know, 24 inches above that, that tie-in knot, and then another one, another 24 inches above that. If, you do get into a situation where you know, you're able to be lowered out of the system or you need to be um, taking that 10 seconds to do that can give people on the ground the resources that they need. Uh, what are some of the ways that you base tie and why do you do it, when do you do it, and when don't you? All right, so my feeling about base ties is, all right, obviously base ties are why I got into stationary rope climbing because of not having to isolate my line. Um, I never had, well, that's not true. I did use base ties in a moving rope system uh, somewhat, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, for next for, time. For, for the most part, I use a bowline with a bite um, for a base tie, and like you said, you can put a butterfly. When you're climbing on a, a moving rope system, I never had a base anchor that was lowerable. Um, but that said, I do, uh, I really like my base ties. I really like my base anchors. Um, I can control my climbing. I can get the tie-in points I want. I can work through the canopy. Um, and it's, I'm a big fan of base anchors. Obviously, if you're doing a removal, you want to use a canopy tie. If you're doing any major rigging, you want to make sure your base anchor is either out of the way or you want to convert to a canopy anchor. Um, one of the nice things about SRT, and I touched on this before, is that you can dictate how much rope you are climbing with, right? So if I'm climbing a 50-foot tree and I have a 200-foot rope, I don't want all 200 feet in my system. So I can set how much rope I want. So maybe I'll, I'm planning on doing a few redirects. I can set my rope right there, and then I can come over here and um, base anchor. So you don't have to. So what I do, what I did here to demonstrate was I used the end of the rope. That means that however much extra rope I have, I basically have to use it all. Whereas what you're gonna, what you're talking about is tying in midline for your base tie, so that you yeah, control so, the amount out front. So I'll set and what my usual method is I just use a a bowlin with a bite. So I bring around the bite like this, and I tie through, and you always want your backup. So either a half hitch or you're running, but see that's midline attachable, you can adjust it. Um, now this is not lowerable. This is not a lowerable technique. And I never had a lowerable technique when I was climbing in a moving rope system, so it's not a big, never been a big deal to me. However, um, I have begun to appreciate having a system that is adjustable. So not even as much lowerable as your priority, which is a nice attribute. I won't, don't get me wrong. I think there is a place, especially during ascent, that um, being lowerable is, is a nice, nice deal. Um, so for... I'm going to just move this down a little bit lower. And you can use your tail to make the sling around the tree. Um, but one, one of the things that I really like about having an adjustable system is that you can set how much rope you want, and then you can have your ground guy feed you more if you need to. If you go into another tree, or whatever, and um, so a nice friction hitch, you back that up with a, a little butterfly. Um, 
you don't absolutely need uh, eight above it. In fact, if you have a, going through a lot of redirects, you don't really even need a figure eight, but um, it can be helpful to have a have a figure eight above, or or simply a Munter hitch. But if you're going through a lot of redirects, you don't you don't even need that in your system. But see, now this is nice. Um, not only because if, in case I needed to be rescued, the ground guy could come over here, untie my butterfly, and lower me down the, lower me down the tree. He can also, I can also say, hey, Jeremy, I've passed over to another tree. I've done my redirects. And oh my gosh, I don't, I don't have enough rope to get to the ground anymore. Can you feed me some more rope into the system? Or maybe I set too much rope and I need him to adjust it shorter. So having an, a system where he doesn't have to untie my bowline and he can just, if you have a rig or a, D, a ISC D4 or one of those devices too is a really nice way to, a quick, quicker than setting up a friction hitch. But having something down there that allows the ground person to feed you more rope into the system so you can go into the ne that next tree. And you know, I always, I have two 200 foot ropes. I don't really have a need for short ropes. Even though a lot of my trees are 30 foot trees, I'll just use 30 foot of my 200 foot. And leave the rest in the bag. And just leave the rest in the bag. And if they need to feed out more, more into the system, they can, they can do that with no problem. Even, um, Somebody who's never climbed a tree can, I can be I'll like, just out. pull, 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 pull more rope through, pull more rope through. I don't recommend having groundies advance your line for you who've never done it. Um, well, you definitely don't want them untying a bowline and sure. retying a bowline. Absolutely. So. That being said, I think that's a, an awesome kind of look at some of these adjustable base anchors. You know, there are a ton of different ways to provide lowerable base anchors. We can't cover all those and we decided not to really even try today, but um, there's a ton of different ways with Petzl rig or ISCD4 or figure eights and uh, Prusik's and another rope wrench. One of the things that with, with those lowerable systems that's a, a problem that a lot of people will set up these fancy lowerable systems, but they don't have enough rope to actually lower the person out or of the tree anyway. Or they're lanyarded in in the instance yeah. of an emergency. And I don't know anyone, um, and I don't know anyone that knows anyone that's ever actually been rescued by a lowerable system. So, uh, for me, when I base tie, like I said, throw the two butterfly knots in there and really give people the options that they need in the event that it happens without having a whole set of kit or a whole expense or time kind of wrapped up in it. But um, I want to move on from base anchors and talk a little bit about canopy anchors. Uh, that's not something I know a ton about because I was always kind of a base anchor guy, but uh, maybe you can educate uh, those of us at home. How many people are watching right now, Car? 280. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can educate those 280 people and myself a little bit about some of the canopy tie techniques and tricks you might use. So um, canopy ties, basically the same. So here's the thing, it's the same as your base anchor, except it's in the canopy. So um, your base anchor is your tie-in point, right? If, you're, if you have a base anchor, that is your tie-in point. So you need to keep in mind everything between you and the your tying point which is the base of the tree so the only difference is where we're attaching it and if it's going to be in the canopy is basically the same as a base anchor except the problem with that is when you come out of the tree you it's not as simple to retrieve it um, so but for the most part um, I use canopy ties in uh, when I am doing removals. One, retrieval is an issue because the tree's coming down with me, right? So I don't need to worry about canopy ties. Um, on really thin trees that are kind of shaky sometimes, I'll use canopy anchors. Um, 
for the most part, I find them a pain. Um, other people love them, they swear by them, they can't stand base anchors. I don't really see the point of climbing SRT without base anchors myself, but everybody each their own. Um, you can tie a, a bowline with a bite is my sort of go-to. Again, it's just a bowline. I've left some tail here. Um, again, your backup. And that's a solid, solid um, canopy tie. Now the problem you have, if you're with this, you need to descend the same way you came up, more or less. You're allowed one or two redirects. Um, so if I come over here, right, <coughs> and try to redirect and try to pull it out, I end up getting a lot of force, rope on rope action. So that can be um, problematic. You can end up burning your rope right there. Especially when you start to get underneath that redirect, right? If the redirect happens to be, when it's up here, you go pull down, you're gonna see quite a lot more friction as the tail yep. goes above it. Um, so there's, if you put a piece of hardware in there, a quickie is a good little, you can do a little quick butterfly. It feels a, kind of like a shameless plug, Kevin. It's a shameless plug, quickie. It's kind of a good tool. <laughs> Useful for a lot of things. I got them on my lanyard. Um, but it's just a nice uh, hard link. You want to make sure that when you install it, that um, this side ends up against the tree and not this side. Um, so that will not burn your rope. It's, um, you, it gives you a few more redirect options because you have less friction and you're not um, going to burn your rope up if you go through too many redirects. But the thing with canopy ties, unless you're, um, you don't have a, 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 a ring and ring, do you? Do I have a ring and ring friction saver? You know, I did not, uh, I did not prepare one. I have a I and I with two carabiners. That'll work. Um, so the other, the other thing you can do, so if you tie your, your bowline with a bite, I prefer, some people use butterflies. Butterflies are not midline attachable. I like midline attachable um, for, it's just easier because sometimes you're moving, around, moving them around. And instead of just, um, all right, I'll do this in a little bit. But you can, if you install a pulley, oops. Hand me a pulley and a carabiner. Got another quickie? Um, oh, here we go. And a pinto pulley works really nicely, but any, any pulley, this, this allows you quite a few more. Um, so you're on the rope up there but you have a pulley below it. And that pulley allows you to do quite a few more redirects before you can't retrieve your line. Um, still, you're limited. When I have a base anchor, I'll throw eight, nine redirects into my system before I'm done climbing. Um, you're still limited with this canopy anchor to maybe three or four redirects tops before you're gonna have trouble trouble retrieving. Um, and in some trees, that's not an issue. Um, for other trees, it's an issue. And I kind of avoid canopy ties unless I'm doing some major rigging or have other concerns about my tie-in point. So, you know, we, we talked a little about kind of base ties uh, and about canopy ties. And to recap, you know, the pros of a base tie are 
You don't have to isolate your climbing line. Um, you can get it in there nice and quick. Uh, it does provide a potentially lowerable or adjustable situation. Um, there's some cons to it too though. It puts your rope at risk at the ground level. If something happens to your rope at ground level, it can affect uh, your suspension up in the canopy of the tree. And uh, that can be something that's kind of unsettling for people and um, something that people want to avoid. So that's definitely one of the cons of a base tie. With canopy ties, we know that they provide a little less force on the anchors, which we're about to talk about. It's just a, in, in certain situations they do, in other situations they can have more. Sure, when, and we're going to talk about yeah, deflection yeah, yeah. as well. well don't, don't get too far ahead of me. All right. Um, but they can be cumbersome to install. Uh, in a lot of cases, they still require you to isolate your climbing line, um, which can be, you know, kind of remove some of the uh, good effects of speeding things up with SRT. And uh, they can be hard to retrieve. So we, we talked about that a little bit. Um, I want to I move into just a, a little bit of talk about some of the physics and stuff. Here, let me um, okay. talk about this canopy tie. Um, so there's one canopy anchor that does allow you to um, basically have more redirect possibilities. Um, and this is uh, your basic eye-to-eye -eye, um, cam beam saver, blocked off with a butterfly and a carabiner. Um, it allows you to, you know... This gives you all the benefits of, on retrieval of a base tie. Well, not all the benefits, um, but... I can do all the redirects I want, and then at the end of the day, I can retrieve it. As if it was a base tie. As if it was a base tie. And probably end up getting my rope, my cambium saver stuck up in a crotch somewhere in the process. But it's a very good option. Um, and one of my favorite ways to canopy tie. So at, when you go to retrieve, well, there it goes. Um, so that's an option. Can beam saver. And that can be done with something as fancy or as simple as what you have there or a, uh, a ring and ring friction saver. A ring and ring. You can do it with a rope guide too. I've never done it. I don't have a rope guide, but I've seen people do it with a rope guide. Very cool. So uh, I want to talk a little bit because these things are on the test uh, that everyone needs to take after this webinar to get your CEU. Uh, the link will be put up. Carson will put it in the chat um, on the Facebook as its own separate thing and in the uh, listing for this. So you'll be able to find it. If you can't, just keep looking. It'll be there. Um, but they're going to have to answer some questions about some of the physics. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this. So um, on our PowerPoint presentation here, we've got a, a pretty simple diagram. That, that seems to make uh, a fair amount of sense. If I pull straight down on a load like this um, with either one strand or two around it, it doesn't really matter, that's gonna put a, uh, a 1x load on my anchor. Um, I think everybody understands that. If you understand that, hit the like button. When we start to get into base ties, uh, we put mechanical advantage in play and not the type of mechanical advantage that we see in a double rope system that benefits us, but a type that puts uh, an increased load on the, the other side. And I think a good way to demonstrate that is if you can hold on to this here. If I pull down here with 100 pounds of force, how much force is on the anchor, Kevin? 200. 200. Because while you're not pulling down, you are anchoring that 100 pounds and putting it on this side and here. So in a frictionless setup, theoretically, with totally straight lines, we double the force by pulling down and having it anchored at the ground. Mm -hmm. um, that's the inverse of how your standard kind of two to one pulley system that's pulling it towards you works. Um, but that does happen. So uh, the next thing, and you can see we got our graph right here, is we start to talk a little bit about deflection. So we know that if you come over here, you are my base tie, and I pull down right here, with 100 pounds of force, 
Do, does anybody on the internet know how many pounds of force without looking at the presentation <laughs> uh, that it was going to be? Um, I wouldn't have. I had to do the math, but it's at a 45 degree angle, it's 1.85 times the load. So if I pull down with 100 pounds of force, the anchor is only going to see 185 pounds, not the two that we saw before, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Give me another thumbs up if it makes sense. Can they thumbs up more than once, Carson? Can you, if you can thumbs up more than once, thumbs up again right now for me. Let's see if they come in. Okay, so uh, this isn't you know, necessarily an apple or a, a great diagram of something that happens, but I think it's a step as we continue to talk about deflection. If we go into a 90 degree uh, and pull this way, you'll see on the diagram here that that's gonna give us if I pull down here and you were up there on the truss holding on, that we would see a 1.4 times to our anchor load. So this is where we start to see where deflection can help us lower those forces that we're putting on it. And this not only applies to SRT, but it also applies to rigging. And uh, this math holds true and goes straight into that. So um, something to certainly keep in mind. One of the things that I want to comment on about that, um, and you hear this a lot, especially when it comes to base anchor, um, that you're putting twice the load on your canopy point. And I th think, here's a, this, this, this is a good example, right? Don't get ahead of me, I'm gonna get into compression. Okay, you're gonna get into I compression. I got a diagram, okay. so give All me right. a second here, Kevin. Give me a second, you were supposed to read the presentation, Kev. Well. His truck broke down, I was trying to get him to read the presentation. My truck did not break down. Your, your, your mini loader, My mini, your loader. mini loader. So, um, this diagram is gonna start getting us into uh, two anchor points and how that's spread. Um, you'll see on the left and the right anchor both see in this case a 1.4, right? So 100 pounds coming down is 140 to each anchor and that's assuming a 90 degree spread. Um, this math is not meant for you guys to, to look at a tree and say that's how much I'm putting up there but it's to give you a relative idea of how you're impacting these limbs and the things that you're asking of them when they hold us up. So just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, this is the next point that Kevin was, was trying to make, and uh, this talks a little bit about anchor point forces. In our diagram here, we have this showing with a base tie. So let's take your rope here, Kev. Flip it up. Flip it up there. There you go. I'll just go ahead and tie that on here. So now, give me your, go ahead, do the deflection. Um, so basically, I think people get really caught up in, you're doubling your forces, you're doubling your forces. Now, to me, when I look at my tree and my planning, as opposed to doing the math, which is important to do, um, I find it more important to look at the tree and where the strength of the tree is. And so in this branch out here, if I'm putting one to one like this, I am pulling across the grain of the wood where the, the tree, also you have this co-dominant stem here. Um, not the best thing to be pulling even a one to one ratio on that particular tree. Um, what we want to do with trees is orient the force straight down the grain of the wood. And you can do that with, through your planning of how you run your redirects, how you run your, um, your angles. So you want to get your forces to run straight down the grain of the wood. And you can see he has the arrows. Is that on the screen? Mm -hmm. um, these arrows bisect the angle. So you want to get your angles so they orient straight down the grain of the wood. And to me, that is much more important than your doubling of the anchor point because you can have one-to-one -one on a branch like this where I would rather have, you know, two-to-one where the force is bisecting and going straight down that angle. So, um, this helps us load the tree in compression wood, right? Yeah, you want you want to load in compression. You want you want think you could you could 
stack a million tons straight down on a branch. That's why we use two by fours for crane curving. Why exactly? Four by fours. Uh, whereas that same two by four, if you load it right, you can break it in the middle. Crack it right in the center. Yep. So that is a much more relevant conversation when we're talking about tie-in points and anchor points and how you plane your root of the tree. Um, and why sometimes I find with a base anchor, I can get higher up into the tree than I can with a canopy tie uh, based on how I'm orienting those arrows, those force arrows and getting, and the other thing you have to watch out for is that you can climb in one direction and you're orienting your arrows all in the proper direction, but then you, want, you might end up meandering over here and you're pulling your rope in the totally opposite way. So you have to always keep an eye on where, where the forces are being oriented. And with redirects, you can get into a situation where it's awesome one, to way, one way, but not so great if you switch over to another thing and you end up breaking out a redirect or um, great. Well, causing uh, some trouble we, there. We want to give some people uh, some opportunities to ask some questions. So I am going to pass the mic over to Carson, uh, who's sitting at the sticks. And um, he is going to read some questions or shout outs if you've got something funny or a story. Uh, if you know Kevin or um, you don't want to just say, hey, Kev, or <laughs> say hi to your mom, uh, throw that in the chat right now. We'll try to read that stuff off, um, give everybody their shout outs, and then we'll take some good questions. Uh, and we'll have Carson uh, ask them to you, and we'll see what you got, OK? Awesome. Hey, Sound thanks good. so much. This yeah, has been yeah. really fun so far. And, uh, Still got some time left, and, and let's see what people have to say. Hey, Kevin, thanks again for doing this for us. Oh, we're a little tangled up with rope and mic cords and stuff here. Give us a second. All right. Okay, Kevin, one thing I did notice a while back in the chat is, um, what's your favorite rope for SRT? And what different kind of ropes? I mean, is there one type of rope that's better, S static versus semi-static, semi something like that? You know, it all varies. I've always been somewhat partial to the Yale 11.7. I mean, that goes back to my uh, double rope climbing days. Uh, poison ivy type ropes. Uh, I've played around on really static lines, escalator, the KM3, um, different, you know, there's this vortex, which is, I really like for um, removals, but it's a little bit heavy if you're doing a lot of redirects. Um, I was climbing on 16 strand the other day and it's a little bit bouncy, but then I got kind of into the bounce and um, started using it to go with, so I don't, you know, people people assume that for SRT that you want a really static line. I don't necessarily think that's true. For some things, it's good, but for some things, it's a little bit rougher on your body. Um, I think the size of the grip is a more important thing, really. Um, some people like a skinnier rope. Uh, I like a little bit fatter in the hand. Um, I've been climbing recently on the KM3 Max, which is an amazing rope, very smooth, very static, but it is a little bit tight on my hand. It's small, small for my grip. Um, so part of me wants to move back to a little bit thicker, uh, but I don't know. I think it's all personal preference. preference. You know, so the devices have, has a lot to do with it. So too. you'd say there's a, a big trade-off. You've got stuff like efficiency coming from static ropes. Um, a little softer on your body with something like a semi-static rope, yeah. and then things like uh, grip and knotability, that kind of thing that just kind of comes down to what you prefer. Yeah, and you know, I think some people for the wrench, for example, the wrench, if you're a light climber, uh, you might, you know, if you're in the 130 to 150 pound range, you probably want a skinnier rope so you don't have to fight as much drag here. Um, if you're a fatter climber, you might want a thicker rope so you get a little bit more, more, uh, your hitch works a little bit better. So your weight, I think, has some, something to do with it as well. 
I, 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 I've, I've tended to start shying away from the really static lines. Just they're, they seem hard on my gear and hard on me and then um, even hard on the tree a little bit too. Um, Marseille Zapata says, how do you protect the cambium when you're using a, like a redirect? Um, that's a good, good, good question. Um, the, the, the leather sleeve cambium saver, the Caterpillar, I use that especially in the springtime for, for maples. Um, when you're setting your redirects, you can go with a, as opposed to a static um, or a, a moving redirect, you can set it so it's static using, um, using a sling. Uh, there's some, you can, uh, for instance, one thing, you can, uh, well, let's see here. I don't know if we were going to talk about redirects later, but one of, the, one of the redirects that I've been using a lot, and this is a Joey Tree redirect right here, is take, take a bite of rope around and then tie a clove hitch here. Oops. So I can tie this up tight. Um, so that's a, it's a static redirect. This isn't moving around. It's retrievable. Um, basically, you take your tail. I'll get some. And you clip it in beneath the bite of the rope here. So then when you want to retrieve it, you can pull it out that way. Um, so that's the way to do it, re redirects. I think the best way for your cambium is either you do a canopy anchor or you use a, the Caterpillar um, cambium savers. So, are, so you're saying, in, in a lot of cases using SRT, uh, a friction saver isn't necessarily required because there's no moving rope on the cambium, is that right? Well, that's not, you know, they're ex especially in trees that move a lot, the rope does move and SRT can cause considerable cambium damage. So it's something to be aware of and, and depending on, you know, a, tr a, 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 a maple tree, a young maple tree in the springtime, even your boot will twist off the bark. So you have to be really careful about, um, about it in certain situations. So a cambium, a canopy anchor might be a better solution in those situations. And then using slings for your redirects, um, depending on how much the tree is moving and how much the rope is moving. But yeah, you can, you can definitely scar up the tree. Um, maybe not as much as a, Double rope on, but you can, you can definitely see it, and uh, All right. um, it's something to be aware of. And there, uh, there are solutions. So cool. Um, I have to apologize to Facebook because there are just so many awesome questions coming in, and I'm trying to catch as many as I can. Um, you ascended earlier with just a, a foot ascender. Um, is there is there something else that I can add to that system to make to make ascent even easier? Yeah. So. Um, now I've gotten rid of all my lines. Okay, here we go. The first, you know, the first thing you can add is uh, a hand ascender. That helps. Um, other things, you know, you saw me use a, my lanyard over the shoulder, but um, a, chest, a chest harness is even nicer. This is a Paul Didier Especial. Um, so there's a couple of different ascents. Um, you don't even need an ascender. You could use you could use a Prusik 
you could tie your climb heist. Um, but this is my old footlock loop. This is a low tech method. Um, and so you want a chest harness to uh, this is more set up for my runner. I don't I need a so this is a frog walking system. This is for my left foot or for my right foot in this case. And this is for my left foot. And then, so that's two feet to ascend. This is nice because I can just come on down when I, um, I don't have anything below me to inhibit coming down except my foot ascender, which I can pop off. And you can get a similar effect from uh, from like a knee ascender, like a Haas, for example. Right? Yeah. So this is this is what I used. This is a little bit. Um, I probably can go faster with this method, but there's knee ascenders, which are nice. This is a this is the Haas, which is amazing. You just clip it into your system, and it's got a piece of elastic that goes um, up and down. This is uh, one that I've been using recently that straps over my back and then um, it's just, it's a, this is called the bungee tool um, and it's a piece of bungee. This clips to my back over here and then I have got my foot loop over here. So, um, and this was made by Valentin Dresley in Germany. I've been really digging it, it's pretty fast. But it's just a, there's a piece of bungee in there and it advances your line. I would definitely recommend either the Haas or some other kind of knee ascender tool. Uh, if, you're, if you're really getting into SRT, that is pretty much a key pickup. So your Pantene, the Haas or a bungee tool style device. Um, I can, show you how this um, yeah so this is nice because it just kind of hangs out over over my back and I've got a basic a petzl basic But yeah, that works just like walking up a ladder. I got my mother who's 72 up a 150 foot pine tree using a foot ascender and a, and a, and a hoss. JB Holdway would like to know what's going on with your bridge setup. Okay, so I found one of the great advantages of Stationary rope technique is the ability to um, climb with two ropes. So um, yeah, let's pull pull this out over here. I have two bridge setups because I found that. Um, I can easily go into being tied in twice, um, which can be a great attribute for getting around the canopy if so inclined. Um, so the nice thing about this, I have one setup for that harness. 
And I have one set up. And I can operate both. And what's nice is when you're in two systems, I can keep my weight on one and then advance the other one. Um, there's lots of advantages of having two, two systems. You can triangulate really nicely, get kind of double crotch um, if you're working a, a wide spreading tree. Um, having two bridges makes it so much easier. Having two swivels, see I can come around and do it and I'm still not, if that was on one bridge I couldn't do that without getting everything tangled up. I couldn't just kind of see I can only go with this I have to go the other direction but I can still do a 180 um, and climbing on two two lines you can really you can really do some cool stuff um, one of the problems see if I'm in single line right can you do a backflip uh, you can do a backflip <laughs> on, on two lines can't, but can, can you right now Oh, can I right now? I'm sure I could. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Kevin, we've all seen the backflip on the internet. We want to see the backflip live. You want to see the backflips live? Okay. So, all right. I'm going to just explain this a little bit more with in one rope. If I'm out on a branch and I want to set a redirect and I don't have anything to tie into, what do I do, right? I can't tie in below me on the branch. It's kind of shaky. I can't, I'm kind of stuck. I either have to um, tie into my actual line. I can set, uh, put an ascender here, or a prussic up here and tie into my line so I can move it around. But if I have two lines, I can simply keep my weight in one and then use my other one to set my redirect and you can kind of alternate redirects all the way up the tree. Um, so we can climb and like here, I, I've got my weight already on that, on my primary tie-in point, so I don't necessarily need to unclip or lanyard in. You can get, you can use your pantene to kind of pull you, pull you along. Time. It's a little bit tight in here, but. Don't get your head. Woo! <laughs> but can you do a front flip? Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> it is pretty fun. A good way to get yourself completely tangled up. Now, now the internet wants to know if you can get down. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, as you're, as you're going through this and getting out of this system you've set up here, uh, somebody asks what your favorite hitch combination is on a rope wrench. And can you show us how to tie it? So my philosophy on hitches is that they're basically um, variations of wraps and twists. Um, I don't really feel like I have the same, tie the same hitch two times in a row. Um, but I would say they're for the most part uh, combinations, variations of, of Aldetane, you know, three up. I like a 28. works. 
Um, that's a good one. A little with the, the Cooper hitch, uh, the distal. Um, but like I said, every rope is different. I end up, uh, there's, a, there's a little distal. Um, but yeah, I, with, a, with hitches, I really do mess around with them constantly. I'll take one off, add one, add a twist, add a, add a, add a wrap, take a wrap off. Um, I really, you know, to me they're all variations of wraps and twists and, um, you know, sometimes they work. And the same one that I worked well yesterday, for some reason, doesn't seem to work as well today, and it's not catching me, or it's too tight. Um, it's a, it is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, hitches, because there's so, there's so many ways to do it. And, um, you know, if it's a humid day, if it's a sappy day, if it's a, um, if it's a vortex day, one of the nice things about climbing on vortex is it's in tachyon as well, is they're very forgiving for your hitches. So you can get away with uh, a little bit more on some of these skinnier ropes. It's really hard to get a hitch that consistently grabs um, or is not too tight. So my, my advice for hitches is just keep on playing with them. Don't get stuck on just one. Um, don't think that there's only one way to, you know, there's one good hitch out there because um, they're so variable. And, you know, you fry your hitch a little bit and it'll work different. So. Um, you might have to take a wrap off or add another twist. That's kind of my... All right, Kevin, we're uh, working on wrapping up here. We've, we're already over our time by just a little bit, and we're happy that people are still sticking with us on Facebook. Um, we're going to try and get in just a last couple questions. Um, one that I saw several people ask, um, you mentioned you had a quickie on your lanyard. Can you just, like, show us just a quick sneak peek of that setup? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's just, I, it's a quickie and a sh shizzle. I like it, it's nice and compact. Um, I can still move it to my center if I want to use it for a, another tie-in point somewhere. Any other cool stuff you've got there on your saddle that you think um, uh, we might want to see? No, people uh, probably don't want to look at my saddle at all. Oh, you wowed a bunch of people <laughs> with that bridge, I think, and I, I think they're yeah. I think the bridge. I, I, I and I've put in a word to the tree imagineers to make their tree motion with double bridges. I love having two bridges. It's really the best thing in the world. Um, even if you're not climbing with two ropes, like you can, it just gives you a lot of uh, fluidity. Um, if people want to see that redirect again, I think it's the best redirect, and you won't ever need to know another redirect. Do you want me to show that redirect again? All right. So, Joey Tree redirect. You come through with your bite. Now you take a clove hitch and you want the side of the clove hitch closest to your wrench to go on top. And then you tuck the bite through, and you can tighten it up. This can be kind of long, but you're actually climbing on a you're climbing on a clove hitch. Um, if you're really concerned about it, you can even put a carabiner in that way so. For some reason, this couldn't pull out. This, if your weight is on this clove hitch, it's not coming undone. But um, you can retrieve it by, there's a little X on the clove hitch there. Which you can clip into
with your tail or whatever. So when you're done climbing, this is not a slip knot at this point. So when you're done climbing, you can take this and oops. Um, but yeah, I think that's about the only redirect I use these days other than a natural redirect. So you can get into a lot of, there's huge discussions of over all the redirects out there, but that's the one that I use uh, pretty much regularly. Um, and that's, that's, that is stationary rope technique. Redirects, redirects, redirects. You can do so much with redirects. Understanding the forces of the tree, using that compression wood, using those arrows, thinking about the arrows and how to set that up. You can get really far out there on the canopy, get out to make those nice pruning cuts at the end of the branches rather than in the middle of the tree. Don't cut out the middle of the tree like so many people are doing. Get to the ends, make those smaller, nice cuts. And really, um, really bend it like Bingham, as they say. Bend it like Bingham. Hey, uh, you know, I, I could listen to you to you talk all night long, Kevin, but uh, Carson sent me in here to, to give us the hook. And um, I just I want to say thank you to literally the hundreds of people uh, that watch from all around the world. Uh, there's people from all different countries. Facebook tells us it's pretty cool. And uh, they tuned in to see you. And um, I want to thank them for that. I want to thank people for giving us their time uh, in the evening. Uh, Carson's going to post the link right now for the ISA test. Uh, you got to get 8 out of 10 right, guys, to get your CEU. Uh, you can only take it one time. Um, so, you know, get it right. Well, it's open book. A, that's pretty it's, rough. It's tough, but, uh, you know, a huge thanks to uh, Jim Skira, who's retiring this year at the ISA. Uh, huge, you know, good goodwill to him and God bless. But uh, big thanks for him and Kevin and Emily making this possible, you know, and believing in us. Yeah, and, thank you, Emily. Yeah, letting us do this. And um, not, well, and thank you to your wife, Emily, for. Oh, yes, I thought you thought you No, I was talking about Emily at ISA, but uh, <laughs> okay, th yeah. thanks to the guys at ISA for, for allowing us to provide ISA CEUs for live broadcasts. Uh, we're the only people doing this uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, we're the only people that have done it, and uh, it's really awesome that they were working. Oh, this is the first this ISA is the, CEU webinar? This is no. the first one. Um, this is the third time that we've offered ISA CEUs for a web broadcast. It's the second time we've done a webinar here at the HQ. And uh, it was a leap of faith for them to, to, to do this with us. And uh, I can't thank them enough and tell them how much I appreciate it. So um, thank you to you. Thank you to your wife. Thanks to Courtney, uh, who's in there. I, you know what? Actually, hold on one second. <laughs> Courtney, bring them out here. Come on. Come on. Introduce these young ladies to our crowd. And uh, we're going to let them take They've been really supportive. This is Zoe. Hey, Zoe. You got some bread? Hey, you want the microphone? You want, you want the microphone? Vivian, can you, uh, can you look right at the camera right here and thank everybody for watching? Thanks for watching? Say thanks for watching. How about 7% <laughs> off on every order with the discount code online? No, we'll work on that one. Hey. <laughs> Thank you guys all for watching. Uh, thanks to Kevin for bringing his family out here. Uh, I called him on Monday, I think, and asked him if he would come do this with us. So uh, really appreciate it, man. Uh, it's such yeah. an honor. Thank you. It's it has been, been fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Signing off, treestuff.com.